Hey, Movement Church. Glad you're here today and hope you had a good 4th of July and are well rested after long journeys and vacations. I see the Wallace family's back with us safely. We're glad for that. Glad they're here. We're continuing a series, uh, Make Room, and um, I'm going to move closer to my fan here. Today, we're going to be talking about making room for worship, okay? Making room for worship from John chapter 2. <clears throat> and we got a little uh, film clip that, uh, that we want to show right now just to get started. <clears throat> Sister, you're suffering deeply. You're worried about your little girl, aren't you? Yes, <clears throat> Stand up, darling. The Lord tells me that a strike unto any of his children is like a strike unto him. Oh, Lord, I hear you. Please forgive me. Well, Jesus, forgives you. Now say hallelujah. <laughs> Fishing cap, section four, row F. You, sir, come up on stage and be cured of your gambling. Wow, that's incredible. Section one, pink moo moo. She lost her job at the mill. And you, ma'am, in the nice pink dress, deceive the Lord and you will find another job. Section three, first row, the white shirt, back problem. And you, sir, believe in the Lord and cure your backache. Same section, yellow shirt, hearing problem. And you, sir, in the yellow shirt, come on up on stage. Hearing problem. <laughs> section two, the blue-haired lady, she's got arthritis. And you too, ma'am. Come on up on stage. Oh, we're going to help some people tonight. Anybody recognize that movie? You have to be pretty old to recognize it. It's from, it's from 1992, A Leap of Faith. And, um, you know, it's, it's somewhat funny to see it, but uh, as you probably saw what was going on there, they had information about the people that had attended through a prayer card where they had their name and some information about them and prayer requests, like what was concerning them most. So it enabled him to look like he was doing a miracle, that he, he knew these things about the people and could say, Bobby Wallace in the first row, number one <laughs> seat. Um, so they, they assigned them seats. So it's pretty cool for a movie, kind of interesting. Um, I don't think I've ever seen the whole movie, but that part uh, seems to really apply to what we're talking about today because um, actually that idea for the filmmakers for that movie came from an actual preacher who was doing the same thing. His name was Peter Popoff, uh, popular in the late 80s, 90s especially. And that's exactly what he would do. Uh, he had the prayer cards. His wife would give him the message through the earpiece. Everybody was just awed, thinking he was the greatest guy ever. They'd give him money, millions of dollars for 20 years. He would sell um, miracle manna, miracle spring water, and things like that. So, you know, those type of things only happen in more modern days, right? In the last couple decades, scams that really never happened before, right? Yeah, unfortunately, they've happened for many, many years, uh, many years, thousands of years. And uh, maybe an example would be uh, the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages, um, which would uh, have you, it was very corrupted, popes were corrupted back then, but um, they would have... Uh, you give money and say, if you gave enough money, it would shorten your time in purgatory, which was a doctrine of the church, kind of an independent state or an intermediate state between death and final destination. So there was a saying back then that went like this, when the coin in the coffer rings, a soul, a soul from purgatory springs. And that was actually something they used back then. But I'm gonna tell you this, that those, those things are bad but what we're going to be talking about today in Jesus' time in a passage that is called the cleansing of the temple is probably even worse. Uh, so it did happen even before the church began in Jesus' day. And we're in the, the Gospel of John, and I think um, Bobby and Stephen have told us about the uniqueness of the Gospel of John. Um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke had already been written. 
They were available for people to see. John the apostle, of course, he was witness of everything um, the other apostles were witness to. So he had the advantage of knowing what was in the other gospel books and then being able to cover many of the same things, but then add a few extra things that he decided were important uh, for his readers to know. So it's kind of interesting that this passage, the cleansing of the temple, actually appears in the beginning of John's gospel. It appears at the end of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So it's pretty obvious that there were actually two cleansings of the temple. Jesus did this twice, okay? Once early in his ministry, once very late, uh, very close to his time of death. So let's look at that passage. We're in John chapter 2. We're going to read verses 12 through 17 first, okay? After this, he went down from Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all of them from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these things out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a marketplace? His disciples remembered <clears throat> that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. <clears throat> Talk about a scam. <laughs> I'm gonna give you some details of what a scam it was here in a minute. But uh, we find that we're taking up uh, where Stephen left off last week in Cana, about 20 miles back to Capernaum, and then uh, the whole long walk to Jerusalem for the Passover, which is uh, 60 or 70 miles, depending on where you, where you start from. <clears throat> but notice in this passage, he, he also uh, fulfills Old Testament prophecy uh, by uh, verse 17, saying, you'll have zeal for your father's house. It was about Jesus, written way back in the Psalms. So let me just tell you a little bit more about this because Passover was a, was a very important thing to the Jews and still to many of them today. But, um, you know, you notice in that passage it said they went up to Jerusalem and that's always kind of confusing because Capernaum is north of Jerusalem, but it was a 3,000 foot elevation climb from Capernaum <laughs> to Jerusalem. So it was quite an event to get there. Uh, at that time. And while they were uh, walking along, uh, they, they would be in groups of families and big groups would, would go along with, uh, with others. It was so important that the, the officials actually repaired the road between Galilee and Jerusalem so the travel would be, be easier. And they would sing as they traveled. Um, if you look at your Old Testament, you see in the book of Psalms, Psalm 120 through 134 says it's the songs of the ascent, the ascent to Jerusalem. And they would sing those songs as they traveled in, in the groups. But here's the details of what was going on there in the temple at that time. <clears throat> the temple leaders had totally corrupted the Passover feast. Sometimes it was called the bazaar of Annas. Bazaar is kind of a, a word we don't use that much anymore as far as being a place. We say, oh, that's a bazaar. <laughs> but bazaar being a great marketplace with lots of stuff going on, people selling and buying things. So when you would come to Jerusalem for the Passover and you might bring your offering with them, an animal, a bird, to be sacrificed during the Passover, most of the time, the priest would look at your, your dove and say, oh, sorry, that's no good. <laughs> Not good enough. But we have some for sale right back here that we'll be happy to sell you for a great price and add the temple tax, a temple tax on the people as they came to worship. Then if you didn't have the proper coinage, everything was coins back then, 
if you didn't have the Palestinian coinage, they wouldn't take it, but they would be happy to exchange it. These are people in the temple. These are the religious leaders. They'd be happy to exchange it for you for a 15 to 20 percent fee, probably plus the temple tax. So they had made it so that um, really only wealthy people could come to the Passover, Passover on a regular basis. It, it counted out the poor people. They might only get to come occasionally or once or twice in a lifetime. So to worship God, you had to obey the system. And that created this environment, this atmosphere created uh, haggling, arguing, fights. You would hear doves cooing, cattle mooing. I think bulls groan more than moo, but I, I'm not a farm person. And then sheep baying and coins clinking. It wasn't a very good atmosphere for worship. Um, you know, people were trying to pray in the temple. They were reading scripture, having scripture read. Uh, there might have been people getting together to sing psalms from the Old Testament. And all that time, these things were going on. Uh, animals making noise, a loud exchange of money clanging around, and then there probably was the, the smell, <laughs> too, of animals being right there on, on the premises. So do you see why Jesus was upset? <laughs> can, you, can you understand a little more how he was upset? Um, what they were doing to his father's house, how, how they were uh, abusing worshipers, how they were uh, excluding some worshipers from even being able to be there. So we see that with authority, he drives them out of the temple. It's pretty easy to find a, a cord or a rope because there's so many animals around. There would be lots of cords and things to, to, uh, to keep them in place. He makes a whip and drives them out. And then he also, uh, in that passage, or in that event, he fulfills another prophecy that's mentioned in the other Gospels where he says, you have made my father's house of prayer a den of robbers, okay? So that's, that's the scene. That's what's going on. That's why Jesus does what he does there in the temple. And we can, I think that helps us understand his anger in, in what he did. But now we come to a major transition in uh, this passage. We come to a major transition in uh, Christianity in the next few verses. So listen, listen closely to those and read along. <clears throat> 18 through 22. <clears throat> then the Jews de demanded of him, what miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it up again in three days. The Jews replied, it has taken 46 years to build the temple and you are going to raise it in three days. But the temple he spoke of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Jesus is hinting at something major that's going on here in faith in God and Jesus. And that kind of brings me to my, to my second point. Uh, the first point being Jesus is very serious about protecting the proper atmosphere of worship in his father's house. And we can see that through the cleansing of the temple. But then the next two points kind of uh, actually hinge on that first one. And now we need to look to see um, what's going on uh, in personal worship, how the atmosphere of personal worship probably changed from what Jesus has just said. So as we know in the past, um, people brought sacrifices. Animals were sacrificed to, to try to not totally forgive sin, but to at least push, push the, the penalty for sin back as, as uh, we found out that, that the Old Testament 
writers are thinking about Jesus coming in the future to be the ultimate sacrifice. So Jesus has given us a hint that he is the ultimate sacrifice and he's gonna be sacrificed in not uh, too long down the road. So it's no longer, we're gonna find out that it's no longer that we're worshiping in God's house, the temple, but we're gonna find out that we are God's house, okay? Christians believing in Christ, baptized believers, we are his house, okay? And we're gonna read some scriptures about that here in a second. So let's just talk about worship for a little bit. What is worship? Um, you know, what is, what is this all about? And the word worship comes from two words, wor- worth and ship. So it's something is worth a lot, and then you want to worship, uh, worship that, that thing or that, per- that person. So there's a couple definitions that I'm going to share with you um, here of worship. One is reverential response to God's magnificent, a response to God's saving acts and homage to God. Homage just means public honor and respect. Number two, worship is when we give our deepest affections and highest praise to someone or something. Three, honoring someone or something as the most important thing and acting accordingly. And I don't think that's about the latest iPhone or anything, worshiping that. But it's about, uh, it's about worshiping God. So a little bit more about worship, a couple of scriptures, we're gonna, a couple of passages of scripture, and there are many passages that tell us about worship um, and give us ideas on this subject. First one is 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own, you were bought at a price, therefore, honor God in your body. So this is a, this is kind of a, the new concept, the transition that we mentioned earlier, that um, we are all part of Jesus' body now, if we're believers, okay? His body and what happened to his body enabled our sins to be forgiven. And when we accept him as Lord and Savior, now we are part of that body, okay? Did you notice that passage? Um, you know, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So before, uh, the temple was the temple, a building where God's presence was there. The temple's no longer in effect of that building, but now God's presence is where? It's us, okay? We are God's house, and when we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit in baptism, we are that temple. So the whole language of, of, of body, the body of Christ, is uh, very important in the New Testament because we are part of that body and uh, we, we work together as part of that body. Let's look at another passage, Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, This is your spiritual act of worship. Once again, talking about bodies, okay? Our bodies are his. We should be giving sacrificial service to him uh, through the body. So the church is the body. You know, we, we each have a part in the body of Christ, and then we all are the body of Christ, okay, as as Christians. So um, getting back to the individual personal worship, you know, what, what is the atmosphere for that uh, based on what Jesus has told us earlier? He's very concerned about uh, the proper atmosphere for worship in his house. So now we're worshiping in his house. You know, we're worshiping with our bodies because that is his house, okay? And how we should act, how we should uh, live our lives, what we should do in the area of personal devotion uh, is, is very important to him because it's very important to Jesus. 
So as we um, worship him individually, um, sometimes it's very private. Sometimes, well, all the time, worshiping him personally is a continual thing. It's all the time. It's not just on Sunday when we come here, but as individuals, uh, we worship him all the time. So once again, uh, connected to this same idea, Jesus is very serious about protecting the proper atmosphere for worship in his father's house. Uh, The next point and the last point is this. What is the proper atmosphere for the corporate worship of the church? Corporate worship means what we're doing right here. You know, we're, we're here together, the body of Christ. All of us have the body, and we're, we're the body of Christ together, worshiping together. When, uh, when I was young, um, my sister and I, I think we were maybe like six and eight or something years old, and um, we had a church building something like this where we had folding chairs and there was, uh, you know, room behind it, behind the last row to get by there. And we were on the last row, and, you know, my mom was close by, you know, maybe she wasn't watching us very closely, but we were goofing around a little bit. I'm not sure what we were doing, because that's been a lot of years ago. (laughs) But um, anyway, we're kind of goofing around during communion, you know, and we were not very observant because our dad was serving communion that day. And so we're goofing around there, communion's being passed out, and all of a sudden, my dad is walking behind us, we didn't know it, and he takes his big finger and he just goes, pow, pow. And it's like he was testing melons to see if they were ripe or not, you know, that that sound, that kind of. But he was teaching us about what the proper atmosphere was for corporate worship (laughs) in that. And uh, I think we learned a lesson especially not to goof around during communion when dad was serving. But um, anyway, we'll, we'll get back to that, that, uh, that kind of thought in a minute. But first, let's just look to see, um, you know, what, what happens in corporate worship. And I think we, we're pretty aware of this, but, um, you know, what we do here is, is strictly based on Scripture, you know. And this first passage that we're going to look at in... Uh, Acts 2, 42. Devote yourselves to the apostles' teaching. We have teaching while we're here. We have preaching. We read the word. We apply the word uh, to our lives. To fellowship. You know, the whole, this whole thing is fellowship, this whole event. But, you know, there's particularly good fellowship time before we, we start the song service fellowship afterwards, if we don't run out too soon. Um, To the breaking of bread, we just had communion, and uh, back in the very early days of the church, that might have been associated with a meal, and and communion was part of that. And then prayer. You know, we've already had, what, three or four prayers already today, so we're, we're praying. And then another passage is uh, Colossians 3, 15 and 16. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish, admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. all part of worship, all part of corporate worship, as we talk to one another, as we greet one another and say, how you doing? You know, what's going on in your life? Can I help you? Can I encourage you? Sometimes admonish you in something that would help you in your Christian walk. Those were all things that were done in the early church. And then, of course, we, we, we see that they sang songs and hymns and spiritual songs which we've just, just done uh, in the last few minutes. So the pattern that we use today is very, very much the same as the New Testament church. And, um, you know, that's, that's good because that's a, that's a good pattern. That's what the first believers did with the apostles there 
to help organize what they did in corporate worship. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the proper atmosphere for corporate worship. You know, because we know from the cleansing of the temple that Jesus is very concerned about what the atmosphere is like in his father's house. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're in this together, you know. Um, we're all sinners. We're forgiven sinners if we're Christians. Uh, we have so much in common. We're all part of the body. Um, you know, so being together is a very, very important thing. So every part of worship is important, okay? Every part of corporate worship is important. When we're taking communion, um, you know, it's not just about me and God or you and God. You're doing it with your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a, it's a group thing, uh, each of us as part of the body of Christ. The scripture um, ministers to us, ministers to our hearts. And I just want to say a little bit about singing, okay? Um, our band, worship band does a great job. I'm thankful for them. Uh, I love the songs that they, they sing, even though I'm an old guy. <laughs> um, but, you know, those songs are, are scripture, you know? They're scripture or about scripture. So when we're singing those words, we're really singing scripture, and that's, that's good for us. That's good for the mind. That's good for the heart. Um, you know, it's something that, that we hope we, we retain throughout the week. Um, do you find yourself singing the songs that we sing here in church, maybe later in the week? Uh, you know, I know, I know we do um, because they're important to us, okay? Now, the only bad thing about that is when you wake up in the middle of the night when you're old like us and one of those songs just pops in your head and you're singing it like for a couple hours. <laughs> Nothing against the, the praise band, but, you know, you know I know Debbie, Debbie always wakes, or often wakes up and says, I had a song on my brain last night and I tried to end it. You know, I tried to sing the last <laughs> line and then I went like that, but it didn't help, you know. So that's, that's the exception. But all the other times, it's, it's great to have those songs on our minds, right? And on our hearts, uh, because it's, it's scripture, it's important. You know, God, God is the one who created music. He's the one who created our voices. He's the one who created singing. And, uh, you know, we're all in this together, as we said, so hopefully all of us are encouraged to sing. You know, it's, it's very much part of worship. You might say, I can't sing at all. I just sing kind of low, but, but you can sing, okay? Just, you know, don't blurt it out too much. But really, we, it's good for us. I think, I think there's something great about the body of Christ singing together Scripture, okay? It's just, it's just something great that uh, we all need to be doing. I'm just going to talk about distractions for a second. Um, I know I'm kind of meddling here probably, but, um, you know, if, if, if Jesus is very serious about the atmosphere for corporate worship, um, you know, we need to talk about distraction, you know. Uh, how, how do we do with that? Do we uh, distract others from getting the message sometimes by something we do or say in corporate worship? I think... Um, you know, we need to realize that when Maddie gets up here with her group and, and says, it's time to worship in song, you know, worship is beginning, okay? Worship is beginning. It's time to give our full attention to that time of worship. And um, it's a transition that we need, we need to make. <clears throat> Sometimes maybe um, there's someone here, and hopefully often, there's someone sitting here that's, that's really getting a lot out of Bobby's sermon, okay? He's really thinking about what he's saying, what he is saying we should do. He's being convicted or she's being convicted, really thinking about it. And then there's, then there's a little bit of mooing over here on this side of the auditorium. <laughs> he's really thinking about concentrating on the Word of God. And then there's, there's some bah, back behind him. 
or some cooing over on the other row. And uh, I think I just challenge us all to, to realize how important corporate worship is, how important it is to Jesus that we're here together as his body worshiping. And uh, hopefully we get all that we possibly can out of that time. I know I try to make it a, a personal goal that um, I try not to distract myself during corporate worship, you know, by, by doing something like, <laughs> um, and I try to make sure I don't do anything to distract others because when worship begins, it's worship time, corporate worship time. I hope that the, that passage will mean a little something extra to you. Um, I think it's, it's a great passage that teaches us what Jesus' perspective is on worship back in his day when he was here and uh, today as we worship as the body of Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we, uh, we thank you for your word. Um, it, it just tells us so much about your plan uh, for salvation, your plan uh, for worship, and uh, just helping us to, to give you the homage that we should. Lord, we're thankful for the, the great transition that you made in worship uh, when Jesus came and how we no longer have to go to a, a place, a particular place, um, a temple several times a year to experience God's presence, but we have it in within us all the time as children of God with the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for all your wisdom on all that you've done uh, to really make worship in some ways easier in our time period because the ultimate sacrifice has been given. We are forgiven or can be forgiven through Jesus. And uh, it's just a great, a great thing that helps us want to worship you more. Lord, uh, go with us as we uh, sing a, a final song, and uh, we pray that your blessing upon our week ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I hope this has meant something to you and uh, about God's perspective, Jesus' perspective about worship. And if you, maybe during this song, if you have a decision to make personally or, or you want to talk to somebody or have somebody pray with you, uh, I'm here, Bobby's here. Stephen's here, um, so I challenge you to do that if you need to.